So the title of this uh, presentation is Activity is Life. Strength comes by exercise, there is no other way, and muscle knows no age. So whether you're nine or 90, you can have strong muscles. On one of my long flights from Australia to the US, I looked at a, a documentary of a 100-year-old athletes. Did you get that? 100-year-old athletes. So the body can move and the body must move. And many people, their health deteriorates because they stop moving the body. And the life of the flesh of the body is the blood. And it is when we move our body, we strengthen our heart. And when we strengthen our heart, it moves the blood much more efficiently through the body. And a low heart rate is not due to genetics. It's due to how much you move your body. So what is the best form of exercise? The best form of exercise has been found to be the high intensity interval training. The high intensity interval training, as the name implies, are intervals of high intensity, intervals of recovery, and used for a cycle. I read a book called Body by Science by Dr. Doug McGuff who talks about the high intensity interval training and he was, he was researching a type of exercise particularly for heart health. And he did what every true health professional does, they tried on themselves first. And so he looked at the history and he found that before the war, some German trainers were training their, their athletes in the high intensity interval training and they found that it gave their athletes an edge because that's what it's all about, isn't it? You've got the best athletes from every land. So it's having that edge. And much was lost in the war. And then the next time the high intensity interval training was talked about was really in about the 80s with a Japanese trainer called Tabata. And today in many gyms you, you have the Tabata protocol. And he was training his figure, his figure skating girls and he got them to do 20 seconds high intensity. Now high intensity is, is running for your life or going extreme getting the, the uh, heart rate and the respiration up. And then he got his girls to do a 60 second recovery and they did this for a cycle of six. And he found that his girls had an edge. Dr. Doug McGuff, he looked at a 30 second high intensity and a 90 second recovery for a cycle of six. And I was watching a documentary on the hit, a documentary in Australia, and they chose a, a journalist. She was probably about 35. Uh, not that fit, sort of reasonably. Slim, probably not as little as me, but looked good. And what they did was they measured her, they weighed her, and they put her through the high intensity interval training. And what she did was 30 seconds high intensity, but she did a four minute recovery and she did this for a cycle of six. Now, if you don't think 30 seconds is very long, have you tried it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I always count because if I don't, I won't go to 30 seconds. When I get to 20, my body says That'll, that's enough. 25 seconds, I, my body says, this is getting ridiculous. 30 seconds, I nearly feel like I'm dying. This is going as hard and as fast as you possibly can. So I found that this documentary that they did was interesting on this girl. They had pictures of her at the end of her 30 seconds and she'd be on an exercise bike. Most of the research has been done on an exercise bike. It allows the person to hold on. 
they cycle as hard and as fast as they can and then the recovery time is just the slow cycling and then back into it. In Melbourne, which is where the documentary happened, there's a park that's got these steep steps and she was running, running up them for some of her 30 seconds high intensity. So what they did was they got her to do this for a couple of months and at the end of the couple of months they interviewed her and she said, I can't believe what this is doing for me. She said, it doesn't seem like it would do it because they're just short little bursts. But she said, I find that I'm sleeping better. She said, I'm finding that my mind is clearer. She said, I'm finding that I'm digesting my food better. She said, I'm finding that my colon's working better. She said, I'm finding that I don't get tired as easy. And when they measured her, she had lost, I think it was an inch and a half on her waist. <laughs> she was excited because she said, it doesn't seem like you're doing enough. You see, you, you take Doug McGuff's, what are we looking at? We're looking at 15 minutes. What the research is finding is that 15 minutes of this high intensity interval training a day does more than a 5K jog. See, I had this guy who um, attended our program and he said, Bob, I don't have an hour a day to do a 5K jog. And I said, that's all right, Dave, you don't need an hour. Now, what they are finding is there are reports of people having heart attacks on the 5K jog, but there's never been never been a report of someone having a heart attack when they're doing the high intensity interval training. It's a powerful type of exercise, so powerful that you will find that the majority of trainers are training their athletes in that now. Now, one of the reasons they love it is that not only is it just a short little bit, but their athletes have got an edge which is, of course, something that they're always looking for. Dr. Al says in his book's Pace, he tells the story of a lady who did seven seconds high intensity and needed 15 minutes to recover. I tell you that story because I haven't met anyone that's quite that unfit, but if that is your unfitness, I've got some good news, it won't stay there because the book PACE means progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion. Progressive means this is progressive. The more that you do it, the better you get at it. And your fitness is not determined by how hard and fast you can go, but how long you take to recover. So notice your recovery time because you will be very encouraged by how that will change. But I'm very thankful to Doug McGuff because he takes you inside the cell and he shows exactly why this is such a powerful form of exercise. But before we go inside the cell, let me just define high intensity. Not everyone can run, but everyone can get on an exercise bike. So it might be running, it might be exercise bike. When I was in the hills of Germany last week, I think it was last week or the week before. I found this track through the forest and I got five very steep hills. So I wasn't doing any running at all because I had a little fall and I injured my, my back and so I couldn't run for a while. So I was very happy to find the, uh, the hills because I just walked very fast up those hills and of course as we've been talking about this week, the biggest challenge is don't open your mouth. <laughs> Did you try it this morning? It's not easy, is it? But remember, if you can't quite do it, be kind on yourself because and allow yourself to have a little slip every now and then, but you will get to the point where you will not need your mouth. Because remember, mouth is giving you dirty air. You know that Bible verse that says, narrow is the road that leads to life and there aren't many that tread it. Wide is the road that leads to a destruction and many there be that tread it. I liken that to the nose and the mouth. <laughs> ah, this is very wide. But you are not getting purified, moistened, pressurised air. Only nose will do that. 
and you will get better at it. Just stick to it. Remember, what Rome wasn't built in a day. You just start with where you can. If you jog on the rebounder, you'll get it. You leap high on the rebounder. Push-ups will certainly do it. Have you done your push-ups today? Can't see any movement in the background. <laughs> if you can't do push-ups, start with the wall. But remember, progressive. This is progressive. The more you do it, the better you will get at it. So that's your high intensity. Maybe it's swimming laps of the pool. I'm so very happy because where I'm staying, they've got a pool. So after I do my high intensity round the streets, then I go backwards and forwards in the pool. And there's this funny little dog that runs up and down the side of the pool when I... <laughs> and I hope he's not waking the whole household up because I'm early. And if you think the water's cold, if you've been diving in the river in, the, in Germany with six degrees Celsius mornings, uh, this water's not cold. <laughs> recovery time, the research shows that the best recovery time is when you're moving, but just slowly. So the recovery time with slight movement, if you're on an exercise bike, it might be slowly cycling. If you're, well, for me, going up the hills in Germany last week, I would just stop and, and do some stretches. Do some stretches, move the upper body, just simple stretches, and then I would once again go up, go up the hills. When Michael and I do our high intensity at Misty Mountain because it's got hills and down, we, we walk down the hill and we, we run up the hills. I think Michael loves exercising with me. His legs are four inches longer than mine, so he just goes whoosh, whoosh, straight ahead. <laughs> we just talk when we're on our downward walk. So recovery time is gentle moving, movement, high intensity is high intensity. You are going as hard and as fast as you possibly can. And it's done for a cycle. So let's go in the cell and have a look at why this is such a powerful form of exercise. So we'll draw up our cell that we've been looking at this week. The glucose goes in, it goes through a 20-step pathway. And that 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the powerhouse. This, this powerhouse is called the powerhouse because it's only an eight-step pathway, but it will deliver a whopping 36 units of energy. The difference is oxygen. This pathway delivers no oxygen. The energy is produced by the process of fermentation. It's the glycolytic pathway. This is the mitochondria, specifically the Krebs cycle, and this is the, what's called the aerobic pathway because it uses oxygen. What we also looked at is how the, the body stores little molecules of glucose. They're called glycogen stores. And they're quick-release glucose stores that are just sitting in the muscle cell waiting to be used. When they're in the muscle cell, they can only be used by the muscle. So your muscle cells are storing glycogen, but your liver can also store some. And if the liver stores it, it can be sent all over the body. We also looked at how when someone's on a high-carbohydrate diet and they're having a lot of glucose, some gets through the energy pathway, some get stored as glycogen, but the excess gets sent over to be stored as fat. So I'd like to show you how this high intensity interval, interval training can reverse that process. So we're going through our 30 seconds high intensity. By the end of the 30 second high intensity, the 20 step pathway speeds up, the eight step pathway speeds up, and that's no surprise. But this 20-step pathway is a very fast pathway, whereas the eight-step pathway is a lot slower. And there's a rate-setting enzyme in there that will also always keep the 20-step faster and the eight-step slower. So when you're running for your life, and both of these pathways are speeding up, 
that 20-step pathway is making more pyruvate than can be fed into the 8-step. And so what the body does now, it stores it as lactic acid. We've all heard of lactic acid. And I think one of the most amazing parts of the high-intensity interval training is that when you're in recovery time, your liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. So when you're in recovery time, you're burning just as much fuel as when you're running for your life. That's amazing. But what's also happening in recovery time is your lactic acid is being mopped up. So your recovery time is a very important part of your exercise because it prevents the over, over, over storing of lactic acid and it allows the cells to keep that balance. Let's, ha let's have a look at the children. Have you watched how children play? They either run for their life or stop, isn't that true? <laughs> when I was a little girl, we used to play hopscotch. And it's my turn to play hopscotch and I'm going for it. And then I stand back and someone else has a turn. Skipping rope. When it's my turn, I'm going for it. And then I step back and someone else has a turn. Elastics, same thing. On the, on the basketball court, going for the life, the, the, the goal gets done, then everyone walks back. Soccer, and you look at the majority of sports, there's this high intensity recovery. Let's go to the African plains, no animal jogs. <laughs> they either run for their life or they stop. And so the researchers of this high intensity interval trading, it's fascinating to see that they've gone into all these areas and found that this high intensity interval training is the most powerful. And Doug, Doug McGuff goes inside the cell and shows us why it is so powerful. But there's more. So when we're getting to the end of our third set of high intensity, our glycogen stores are all getting used up. Because the best time to do exercise is early in the morning, not after a meal, because then you're going to have a bit of a war between the muscles wanting all the energy for running up the hill and the stomach wanting to digest the meal. What is necessary for you to be able to access the glycogen stores is that you be hydrated. So that is very important, that you are well, are well hydrated before you exercise. But what's happening now, especially by the time we get to our third set, maybe up to our fourth set, our glycogen stores are all getting used up. We're running out of fuel. And so now the brain says to the pituitary gland to release the human growth hormone. The human growth hormone is a naturally occur occurring hormone when we're growing. It probably doesn't surprise you to hear me say I stopped growing at 16. My son William grew two inches from 19 to 22. Boys can be growing at a lot, at, at a lot later. So the human growth hormone goes into retirement, so to speak, when we stop growing. But I've met some pretty active retirees, yeah? When the human growth hormone is released, because remember, we're running out of fuel, it releases hormone-sensitive lipase. Now, yesterday, we looked at a couple of different lipases. We looked at sublingual lipase. Remember, under the tongue, it breaks down the saturated fat. We looked at pancreatic lipase that breaks down your polyunsaturated fats. So what does, what fat does lip, this lipase break up? It breaks up our fat stores. So the human growth hormone, when we're running out of fuel, it releases hormone sensitive lipase, which means it starts releasing our fat stores. Remember, we're wanting fuel. The human growth hormone stops the body burning 
glucose as fuel and it becomes a fat burner. And there's another reason why it becomes a fat burner, because glucose burns at four calories per gram, whereas fat, it burns at nine calories per gram. And a calorie is a unit of energy. And we're running for our life. In fact, it's almost as if the body's given a message, there's a crisis, they're running so fast. And so it adapts to that. And one of the adaptations is the human growth hormones released. It starts burning fat as fuel because fat is going to give more than twice the units of energy that glucose gives. We're in a crisis here. When we're running for our life. We, we, need, we need some good fuel. Now, doesn't every weight loss book have that information there as the reason why we shouldn't use fat? But they don't understand what a calorie is. A calorie is a unit of energy. Yes, if you eat more calories than you can burn, they will be stored. But we, when we want a high energy fuel, the body starts burning fat as fuel. The human growth hormone also increases the body's ability to utilize protein. This week we've looked at the importance of eating sufficient protein, our legumes and nuts and seeds. We've also looked at the importance of making sure we leave a break between meals so we've got enough hydrochloric acid to break down our protein. Now we're looking at another aspect. When we, when we implement the high intensity interval training, causing a release of our human growth hormone increases our body's ability to utilize protein. There's more. The human growth hormone increases the circulation of the blood to the skin. And when the circulation of the blood is increased to the skin, that slows down aging. I have a sister-in-law, she married my, my husband's brother, and she's a model. Her name's Abigail O'Neill. She started modeling at the age of 36 and they thought she was 17. She lives like this. She's never drunk, she's never smoked. Mind you, there's a bit of genetics there. She's very beautiful. But remember that genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. There are, there are many beautiful women that by the age of beginning into their 40s, the, the wrinkles and the cellulitis is coming, but not this with, this with this woman. She's incredibly beautiful. They said to her one day, we don't want a 17-year-old for this photo shoot. She said, I'm 40. <laughs> She's got three teenage children. And her husband has built her some steps, and she does this every day, <laughs> the high-intensity interval training. She's a great illustration that genetics may load the gun. Oh, she's got some good genes there, but it's lifestyle that pulls the trigger. In fact, she's stepped into the modelling game. She's stepped into a hole because so many models by the age of 40, they're drinking too much coffee, smoking too much, so they don't want to eat, and the cellulitis and the wrinkles come, but... Not so my sister-in-law, I'm sure the wrinkles will come, but they're taking a while. <laughs> See, there is a formula, and if you abide by the formula, you will get the results. The uh, movie stars pay $1,000 a week for this, the human growth hormone, because their profession is dependent on them looking good. Well, I'm offering it to your cut price today. 15 minutes of high-intensity interval training a day will cause a release of the human growth hormone and that will remain active for 24 hours. What a bargain. If you don't think you've got 15 minutes in a day, it's time to do an assessment of what you do with your time. I was reading in, in a book called uh, Christ Objects Lessons about the stories that Jesus gave and one about the talents. And the writer commented that the talent we will be most accountable for is the talent of time. What do you do with your time? 
And if you don't think you've got time to exercise, start to make an assessment of how much time you spend on your phone, how much time you spend on your computer, your iPad. What do you do with your time? In fact, this is the best insurance policy that you can make. Because the dividends it gives back far exceed the effort you put into it. Far exceed. Now you, now you know the secret. And by the way, you can have twin, women, twin girls, identical twins. One goes to the mountains and lives like a hippie and one gets into modelling and then movies and takes the human growth hormone. By the age of 50, the wrinkles are coming anyway and she can't afford the human growth hormone, so she stops. And in six months, she ages 10 years. Now let's have a look at both of those women when they're 60. Who's going to look good? <laughs> the hippie in the rainforest or the hippie in the mountains who naturally does the high intensity in her work. One lady said to me, yeah, but I'm active all day. I said, it won't do it. You've got to take that little chunk, that little chunk to do this high intensity because at the end of it, you're going to need a shower or dive in the creek because you're pushing yourself to the extreme. Some people are a bit scared to do that. They think they'll have a heart attack. No one's had a, ever had a heart attack doing this. And you'll also notice that your pulse will start to get a little bit slower. My son, Peter, when he was 28, he was training for a triathlon. He was running up and down the hills behind Brisbane. And about that time, he's a Tyler, he was dismantling an old vanity unit, an old 50s vanity, you know, they're really heavy. It had a big chip out of it. And as he got it out, it slipped and it hit his ankle. And I think if he hadn't had a bone there, it would have cut off his foot. And the blood hit the roof. And he called out to my other son, my older son, James. He said, James. And apparently James said, I'm on the phone, mate. And Pete said, I think you'd better come quick. <laughs> and I tell you this because there was a delay before James came. And James said when he came into the little bathroom, there was this magnificent spray of blood all over the walls and all over the roof. Anyway, they bound it up, took him to hospital. And the nurse kept taking Peter's pulse. She couldn't believe that it was 50 beats per minute. That's why it hit the roof. His heart was so strong that every beat pumped so much blood that it didn't need to beat as much. Now, if Peter's pulse was 75 beats per minute, the blood wouldn't have hit the roof. It would have gone... Woof, woof. Why was Peter's pulse 50 beats per minute because he's running up and down hills. Now you probably can imagine he didn't get into the triathlon. He had, a <laughs> he had to wait for his foot to repair. But an illustration of how, how we can strengthen this heart. And the more we strengthen the heart, the less it has to beat. And Peter's heart goes boom, boom, rest. Boom, boom, rest. What's the rest like on someone with 80 beats per minute? Boom, boom, rest, boom, boom, rest, boom, boom, rest, boom, boom, rest. Not as much rest. It's like Peter's, Peter's heart's emptying the bathtub with a bucket. Boom, boom, gosh. Whereas someone with a heart rate of 80 beats per minute, they're emptying the bathtub with a little teacup. Boom, boom, rest. And we are the ones that actually influence that, how that heart rate goes, yes? Well, what happens with the 15 minutes a day with the high intensity interval training, you certainly can do two lots of that, but that, they have found that that's enough. So, so that's, that's powerful. I don't know about you, but I'm busy. 
And I was so excited when I heard this, whoa, this is great. And the other is running on your toes. I read a book called uh, Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. And this guy was a runner and he had lower back problems, he had hamstring problems because he was running in those padded joggers that encourage heel strike. If you run barefoot, you will never heel strike. You see, our toe was designed as like a cush, uh, a shock absorber and a cushioning effect. So, so Christopher McDougall decided to go on a, on a travel around the planet looking at runners and also historically. And he looked at Olympic Games 1960, 1964, Abibi Bakila. I don't know if anyone's heard of Abibi Bakila, African runner. He won gold, barefoot runner. Nike and Reebok hate this runner. <laughs> barefoot runner and he just won gold in all these games. So he looked at at many runners that he found in different places of the planet. And what he came to was the problem is people are heel striking instead of toe striking. So when I read this book, I went straight out and bought some barefoot, barefoot runners, thin-soled runners, and I started just, just running on the toes. And the next day, oh, were my legs sore. And I realised that you use a totally different set of muscles when you toe strike to heel strike. Have you watched children run? How do children run? Always on their toes. Always on their toes. So running on the toes is, is very important. You will walk with a heel strike. That's how we walk. But it's the jarring with the running that, that does the pelvis, lower back, hamstring, knee those problems. But there's a form of exercise that I'll touch on that you can implement with this and that is the rebounding. And the rebounding is a little mini trampoline and they have found that rebounding is the only exercise that affects every single cell in the body. And every time you jump there's a, there's a, uh, a reaction from the body. And that reaction causes a strengthening of every cell in the body. And when you're rebounding, you are defying gravity, and that's the best way and most powerful way to, to build strength is defy gravity. So you're defying gravity, you're accelerating up, and when you accelerate up, all the little lymph, lymph gates in the body open up. And then you come down and then you've got deceleration, every little gate shuts. So you've got this acceleration, deceleration, acceleration, deceleration. That's constantly happening, causing the little gates in your lymphatic system open shut, open shut. And your lymphatic system is your body's vacuum cleaner. And your, your vacuum cleaner system, the lymphatic tissue, it sweeps away waste from the tissues and then they come into the lymph nodes and then the lymph nodes have the lymphocytes in them and then the waste is taken into the blood and then we urinate, sweat, out through the colon. That's in very quick, simple language of how, how the body cleans house and we should be cleaning house every day. And you watch children. If you've got a trampoline, where are they? They're out there. In fact, I've come to the conclusion that people get old because they stop jumping. What's the old saying, jump for joy? What do children do as soon as they're able? They start jumping. So it's time to start jumping, but the beauty of the rebounder, it's a it has a shock absorber effect. So when you're, there's no jarring, there's no jarring at all. And it's and you've got a second heart, and that second heart is your calf muscle. And your calf muscle is what? stimulates your venous system, which is the system that goes back to the heart. And the rebounder particularly does that. So it's excellent exercise for people with varicose veins because there's no jarring, there's a shock absorber effect. So look at, look at the rebounding. Yes? 
No, there's no real difference between the trampoline and the rebounder, but as I say to people, you've got a, you got a trampoline in your backyard, I can tell you right now, you're not going to get out there. But if you have a rebounder in your home, you are more likely, <laughs> you are more likely to do it. And they can easily be put up on their side and put behind the lounge. Albert Carter, he wrote a book about rebounding in about the 1950s. And his son has revamped the book, and I think it was written in the early two th- or the mid 2000s. And um, he shows the power of the rebounding, so it's not 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 hard to get information on that. And so ends my lecture. My time is up. And tomorrow we're going to go to headquarters. Tomorrow we're going to go to the mind. And I'm going to show you how to rewire the brain. Isn't that good news? We can be rewiring the brain right up until until the day we die. And I think in the afternoon it's safeguarding against depression. So I'll hand hand over to, to our friend now. You know, if we opened a health centre, we'd get really busy. He said, well, we might look at that.